Well, hello. Wednesday, uh, the day of the court hearing in the Idaho 4 case regarding cameras in the courtroom. I'm sure you guys have been engaged in that, and many have already seen all the back and forth via the Twitter and the different people speaking upon it. Um, the judge has not made his decision. I'm sure that will be coming back soon. So I'm going to actually refrain from talking too much about today's happenings. I want to revert back to yesterday, Tuesday, when Brian Enton actually did an amazing interview with Steve Gonzalez, the father of one of the slain Idaho 4 victims, beautiful Kaylee. And I want to, first of all, speak about how much respect I actually have had in the manner that he is conducting himself and uh, being able to hold himself together in the loss of one of his children. I don't believe I would be able to do it as well as he is. I know many have spoken, including I, about some of the past where maybe we feel as though he's spoken out a little too much regarding the case. But after engaging and watching in this recent interview with him, I think I've gotten a much better understanding of how he feels and why he speaks the way he does, and maybe even why he's as frustrated as he is. One of his statements clearly hit me hard because I really reflect at my marriage. I love my wife with everything I am. I do not have children. However, my wife stood beside me through years upon years of frustrating times and times that I needed to change my life for the better, and she was always my biggest supporter and biggest love. So, of course, I am uh, 100% uh, I guess in debt to my wife for everything that she's done for me. She's been the one person in my life that's touched me so deeply that I've been able to change my path and, and change direction in life altogether and head in a whole new direction. So I got to thank only her for that. So the statement that Steve made regarding his daughter where he clearly says, Kaylee would have expected me to be her father, not 10%, not 20%, not 50%, but 100% her father. And in that, he needs to stand up and back every word that he ever has to say with the actions of a genuine father. And I, I take to that because I need to do the very same for my wife. And many of us, I probably would agree across the country that are fathers uh, to either a, a daughter or a son, or they are uh, a husband to an amazing wife, a wife to an amazing husband, or maybe even grandparents to an amazing family altogether. We all need to stand behind our actions and never let our voice go unheard when it comes to the protection of our family. So by him making that statement today, it really put a refocus on the way I take many things that the gentleman says. I, you know, I reflect all the way back to the beginning of this case where he spoke upon things and I, I maybe mistook them or, or put them into a reference of a way I felt like he was actually speaking rather than hearing from his heart how much in pain he was and how much justice he was truly seeking, not only for his daughter, but also for the other three victims that uh, were involved in this uh, just devastating of a horrifically bad crime so he in this interview really broke a lot of things down that made sense and a few things that actually made me scratch my head and wonder what am i missing what what am i not looking at about this case which is hard sometimes for me because i'm so analytical and analyzing of everything i look at it that I probably re-look at things more often than most, just trying to get a grasp of what my own mind is making out of it. Um, I, I'm not overly opinionated, and I never discount anybody else's opinion in regards to the way they feel or the way they see something. However, when I do kind of get set in the way I feel about something, it, it you know, that's kind of where I stand. I listen to everything around it, but... I begin to have my own emotional attachment to my opinion of why I, I feel the way I do about something. 
So, in listening to the interview, I'm going to give you a little bit of breakdown based off of the way that I felt and my opinion of where he was kind of going in the conversation. Now, this is not true fact of exactly what he meant by his words. It's what I interpret behind them. And I think every podcaster out there at every media source that's going to relay their their thoughts and opinions to you needs to clearly state these are thoughts and opinions. These are not factual. We are not Steve Gonzalez. We are not a part of the family. So we are not there to read his mind and completely understand everything that he's stating so please take that into consideration when i when i go into what i'm I'm talking about one of the first head scratchers came pretty much in the immediate part of his uh detailed explanation of how he feels about cameras within the courtroom and one of his biggest things that that he spoke upon was his feeling of the prosecution and the defendant and the defense all almost working as if a team, almost as if they're in, a, in an agreement of how this trial and the court hearings and everything should transpire moving forward. I believe what maybe was the camel that broke the back here, and I probably said that wrong and I apologize, uh, this new agreement where the prosecution follows suit right behind the defense's motion to keep cameras out of the courtroom, the prosecution followed straight behind that in agreement, stating their reasoning of why they also wanted to keep the cameras out of the courtroom. Now, Steve Gonzalez and the other victims' families that we know of outside of Ethan's family, because they have not spoken or released any statement of such, and I do not believe that Steve actually speaks on their behalf. I believe that they control their own speaking when they choose to do so. Uh, you know, they, they're staying quiet. But Steve, on the behalf of the others, has stated very clearly that they want the cameras in the courtroom because they believe it's the most transparent way to move forward within this. They want the truth. They want justice to be held, and they feel like the truth, the only way that the people in the community and people like ourselves are going to be able to see the real truth is to see it step-by-step process all the way through the courtroom. I personally am in agreement. I've been in closed courtrooms as a defendant, and I've been in the open courtrooms where they've had media and other various uh, media sources and filming of, of it happening, never to the magnitude of a case like this, but I have been involved in some rather large cases, and, you know, um, I don't think the cameras were ever detrimental within my cases. I've been around other people that have been in the big cases. I was locked up with uh, Mark Godot, who was known as the baseline shooter out of Phoenix, Arizona. Dale Hausner um, and, a co- and his partner that were the baseline shooters out of Phoenix, Arizona. So I've been around some of the bigger uh, video segments of going to court. That was back in 2006 and 07. So it was pre-social media madness but I'll tell you what it was definitely a frenzy via the the cameras in the courts and the reactions outside the court so I do understand how it can make a difference in the court do I feel as though it makes a difference in the jury's mind I don't think so as long as you have proper instructions for the jury and people leading the ju- jury in the correct manner I don't think it will affect them in any way now Steve Gonzalez did make mention that the community in this case was far more important on being involved in this case and being kept up to knowledge of this case and be able to see the, the truth through the transparency and having the cameras in the courtroom compared to the jurors. Um, I'm not sure I fully agree with that statement. I'm, I'm not going to really get too much into that. I to me a community is affected by the crime however it's up to the jury to be in the courtroom present focused on all the details being presented to them via the evidence and the different motions and they in return are going to sequester themselves and work together to find uh, a legitimate verdict i i don't think a community needs to get involved in that i think it needs to go through the court process within the courtroom and then into that jury room um, 
I, I do think a lot of damage can actually come through the community. I know in one of my cases, when I was much younger, my, my case did um, affect our community quite a bit. It affected my family. I know it affected the victims' families. And because of that, there was a lot more of an uproar in the courtroom um, and outside of the courtroom where there was a lot of politics that came into play. And I was very lucky that you know, I had a good jury, and even though I lost my case and I was sentenced to the penitentiary, it was still a fair trial. Um, I didn't have any basis to actually appeal that, and that was good because, you know, today I can look back and the victims and their families got the justice they deserved. I was definitely guilty. And moving forward now as I get older, I can I can hold myself accountable for that and know that the process actually worked correctly. So I think that we need to look outside of kind of how he said, this is how Idaho works and this is how we all react when a crime like this happens in our community. Right now, we don't need to focus on that. We need to focus on getting through the process of the court hearings appropriately, getting all the evidence discoverable that needs to be discoverable, getting the case to an actual trial to where the families could find out whether or not the man is guilty and they could find out whether they got their justice or did not. He doesn't feel a gag order works. I think all of us are in agreement. I definitely am. I think a gag order is a joke. I think it's a concealment of just trying to tame the outside circus that's already happening based off of many people's opinions. And, you know, we, we nobody knows the full facts of the case. So then false facts start being created past those facts and now everybody's got a whole judgment in their mind that probably is completely off and completely wrong i probably don't know all the evidence and i can't speak as if i do but i do know that because you've gagged that evidence i probably think i know more than i really do so um the audience of us and the community does not need to be the ones that even knows uh the full gamut of everything but i think if you released what should be released via a non-gag order hearing i think you're going to have a more uh, tamed audience out here because we're going to feel like we're more intelligent in regards to the facts we're going to be able to base our opinions a little better based off actual facts rather than uh, at both sides guilty and not guilty here no matter how people feel there's many made up non-facts that are being deemed as facts that you know it, it it's never going to be fixed until the the gag order either goes away or we get to trial and we get this moving on sure a gag order is absolutely just like what steve gonzalez says it's a way of trying to control the masses and it's failing it, it's horribly bad and um you know, I, I get to the fact that there's a lot of evidence within this case that's going to be sickening to many people's stomachs that have not been around a, a case of this magnitude or seen this type of evidence before. I fortunately have been around very bloody crime scenes. I've, I've endured many violent crimes inside and outside the penitentiary. So I, I don't have a weak stomach when it comes to this. Some people are that have never endured something of this nature, four young lives taken in such a gross and heinous manner. Now, really, um, the families are the ones that this gag order is supposedly protecting the most, and maybe even the witnesses within the, within the case. But at some point, even though the evidence that's going to be you know, presented in the courtroom is going to be very sickening to them, they're it's going to be just a whole nightmare all over again and over again and over again every time this has to be displayed shown and talked about I, I think it's just better to get some of the details out now get everybody prepared and then move forward um right now steve gonzalez feels like the the actual process is not being transparent it it feels like it's dragging many of the families and the victims and people through the bud and I'm absolutely in agreement with them um, whether I'm talking intelligently enough about that to make a great enough point I believe if you watch his interview I think he makes a very valid point it's very intelligent and I I stand behind it 100% as 
is a man that hasn't stood by, behind him 100% through this whole ordeal. And, you know, I, I've had many of things I can take a step back and shake my head and say I didn't agree with him on. But he has made some very valid points that I have to agree with. And I hope many others will as well. Point blank, he does not feel cameras in the courtroom hurt the case in any means. He doesn't feel like the gag order is helping the case, and he feels as though if we take these cameras out of the courtroom, all it's going to do at the very end of the day is hide the very truth and the transparency that this case needs moving forward. He understands that in his speaking in regards to this case, and this is where I had some issues back in the very beginning of the case, when he spoke upon it, he released a few details that maybe were misspoken or incorrect. Um, he spoke before regarding to the defendant's phone possibly connecting to the household Wi-Fi and later kind of backtracked on that, uh, stating that he missed misstated exactly what he was trying to say that that was never proven no cell phone ever hooked up to their wi-fi the home and i believe he kind of learned a little bit of a lesson from that and that's why he's been less vocal moving through this as he was at the very beginning now I, I don't have any issue at this point with the way he spoke at the beginning if i was a father who lost my daughter i I may have acted out without speaking and actually caused more problems where I would have been in prison and somebody else would have been hurt. So I got a lot of respect for him to try to be the voice and and speak upon the case without losing it completely or showing full out uh, emotion to the point he's very negative, very, very hurt, very angry, crying, um, violent. He, he's done very well. I give him a lot of respect for that. Um, he makes a point that, that kind of rings a bell to me as well, that some people who may be within this case or preparing to testify in this, scene, in this case actually come across to him and seem scared of the repercussions that may come from their words that they have expressed that maybe they made some mistakes in their statements or whether they made mistakes in what they presented out and about uh, within the community or whatever he may be detailing. He didn't break it down, but he stated there's going to be people that are very scared of the repercussions of the mistaken words that they put out there. Either at the end of the day, they have the, the right guy behind bars and they're going to move forward within this, this hearing and he's going to the evidence is going to point directly at him or these people that have made mistakes within their words are going to be put on the stand and unfortunately they're going to be taken apart in front of all of us and be proven to have some um, probably answers they're going to have to give in regards to some of the things they've said. Could it be possibly even more than having to just give answers? We don't know. Possibly. We'll see. I mean, there there are possible perjury charges out there. There's possibly sanctions. Could be also against the defense if they've at all put out uh, incorrect statements or lied upon things. They could also be held in contempt of court and also held accountable for their wording. Now, Steve Gonzalez was... He didn't even have to say anything for me to catch on to this when... Uh, when Brian Enton asked his attorney, Shannon Grace, uh, regarding how they felt about the prosecution's approach to the victims' families in discussing uh, the, the case and discussing evidence, discussing anything about did they feel they were being completely transparent and even more so do they approach them regarding their opinions like about having cameras in the courtroom to get the feel of whether how the victims' families feel on, on which direction the prosecution should go. And this is kind of a telltale sign of maybe why he made the statement that he thinks that the prosecution and the defense are on the same team, being both made statements that they do not feel as though the cameras should be in the courtroom, and nobody approached this family to get his opinion or his feelings in regard to that and instead of answering it with any sort of words he looked directly at the camera 
made a smirk on his face and shook his head no. He obviously was not approached. I'm under the gut uh, assumption this family has not been given many details regarding the case. I don't think they're being kept within the loop. I think that's very unfortunate because most times the prosecution works directly with the victim's families to ensure they feel as though they have some involvement in finding the person that committed the crime and putting them through the justice system to get the end result of a guilty verdict and justice for their loved ones. This family has not been given that respect. Now. Yes, he's spoken, and maybe the prosecution is not 100% happy that he did so. They need to be understanding of the place this family is in. They are in pain. I'm not going to be one of those that gets online and, and starts dismantling the wrongs of this family. Did they possibly misspeak at times regarding certain things about the case? It's possible. I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe they said the absolute truth and it just hasn't come out yet because of the gag order. I don't know. They are not bound by any gag order. They can say what they want. They can share their feelings. And I absolutely, from this point forward, will commend them for doing so and stand behind them with my respects. I couldn't do it. I couldn't. I've sat in prison for years upon years upon years. I'm on the opposite side of this. I created victims in crimes. Now I'm finally growing up as a person and I can feel it now. Like I can feel it. If somebody had done this to my loved one, if they had taken my wife, if they had hurt my wife, if they had taken my wife from me, there would be a wrath on this earth you could never imagine. Could never imagine. People would not be accusing me and being upset with my words on national TV. That They would be preparing for a new court case and trying to find a jury that could be impartial and be fair to the case because they would have so much evidence against me. You would never find a jury that could, could not know what I did. Uh, he wants people to realize that he feels as though... Uh, this was an outsider that came into Idaho and committed this crime. His exact feelings is this was an outsider who came into the state of Idaho to hunt these dumb hillbillies. Should he have said that? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. I mean, we, let's not give that reflection that all of a sudden, you know, convicts are looking at states because they have... Uh, dumb hillbillies or maybe uh, a high level of illegals or, or maybe they're you know they're more of a, a drug induced state or uh, let's leave all of that out but there if he did if this defendant did come to Idaho with a mindset to commit crime why and that's something that we all want to know. That is something that needs to come out. I'm not 100% sure we're ever going to know a motive. Motive is hard. The only way you ever get a motive is something from the defendant has to give you the motive. We can all assume a motive, but nobody in most of my cases ever knew why I did what I did. Nobody. Other than me or the people I shared why or or any of my own personal thoughts or feelings with nobody's gonna know if this defendant had a motive if he's the actual one that committed this crime now if there's other avenues within this crime that we may find out as well because i have this feeling that steve is also under the assumption this may not just be the only piece there may be more and i'm not talking so let's stop I am not talking about a drug connection. I'm not talking about anything other than there could possibly be more to the story than what we know right now. I don't know any theories, and I'm not creating any. I don't know of any other avenues that could possibly tie into this with actual facts. I don't know. 
I'm not going to create that for anybody. Now, in other videos, I'll discuss theories, I'll discuss ideas and opinions and feelings. This isn't one. This is one where I'm only speaking upon a man that's that's given his heartfelt idea of why cameras are not in a courtroom. After hearing him speak, uh, I get the gist of exactly what he's saying. He is a father, wants the courtroom to actually stand up and speak for itself on national stage so everybody can see the transparent, real truth. Right from the trial and from anybody's mouth that gets onto that, that stand to testify, we can hear the exact things they're saying. We're not going to get a secondhand story of it. What I'm doing right now is a second-hand, maybe third-hand, fourth-hand story because other people are putting their opinions out there. So you're going to compare mine to theirs. And these are all opinions, ladies and gentlemen. The only real truth of these feelings that we're speaking upon right now is Steve Gonzalez. His words are his truth. All we can do is speak upon our feelings of them, and that's exactly what I'm doing. He wants the courtroom to do what it's there for and that's to speak for itself and find the justice for these four lost uh, individuals lives I mean if we want to really just sit here and, and go back and forth I think they just need to meet right in the middle they need to put a camera in the back of the courthouse whether it aims directly at the seal on the, the wall of the court which 90% of the times in the states I was in, when there was a camera in the room, at any break, any adjournment, any time there was motions being done between, they aimed directly at the seal of the court on the wall for the state, and they didn't move that until the judge started speaking again, and then it was a widespread video angle, never directly at the defense table, prosecution table, or anything of that nature. It was a widespread angle that allowed the viewing of the courtroom. You could still see people on the stand. You could still see the judge. You still saw the defendant. You saw the attorneys. You saw everybody when it was necessary to be seen. And there was no over-focusing on anything. Now, they need to get rid of the side paneling within those uh, cameras and get rid of the details being released on the side. I don't need to see any more that they've confirmed that uh, he he stalked these victims and he, you know, there's con confirmation of this or that. Get that crap off. There's no confirmation of anything at this point other than we have a sheath at the scene that has the defendant's DNA found on it. They're still in a battle uh, over the, uh, you know, the whole chain of command and everything regarding that that's going to play itself out over time. But... You know, there's so much made up stuff and, and the main media streams are really causing some damage. And I think lately, and I got to take a minute real fast, give a huge heads up and, and big thank you and, and congratulations to JLR, T-Rev, uh, some of these big podcasters out there. They're really making a name for themselves. They're making a difference. They're doing an excellent job. Um you know, we just had the Pennsylvania escapee and T-Reb and JLR were on for constantly 20, 24 hours straight. These men put in extreme amount of work into what they did and, and they deserve all the accolades for that. Um, and I give them a big shout out. JLR, Gary Hughes, uh, T-Reb, Jewels of All Trades truth and transparency all of you guys amazing amazing at what you do um i'm a different style i'm a newbie to this guys i don't have the technology savvy that they do i'm not as great of a speaker on camera and i, I i'm not all there yet i'm working on it i'm coming out of the darkness that's one thing about me um they probably haven't served calendars upon calendars of years in the penitentiary. And if they have more power to them, they've changed their lives. 
I'm still a work in progress, guys. I'm I'm moving forward and I'm doing the best I can. Um, so please like and subscribe subscribe to my channel, uh, A Convict's Thoughts. I will not only be discussing uh, truth, true crime, the Idaho Four case, other true crime cases as well, but I will project into some of my own personal experiences that I endured and give you an idea of, of where my family endured, the victims of my crimes endured. I'll give you, you know, some interjection of who I am and and why I'm turning my life around and where I'm going in life. And I, I hope all of you join me and are a part of that. So I, I'm very appreciative of the subscribers and likes I'm already getting. Many of you guys are, you guys are uh, full of love and, and communicating on, on my YouTube channel and keep that up. Please subscribe, please like my page. Keep up the, the momentum of helping someone that's better in their life and, and is pushed in the momentum to try to help others in the same position do that as well. So I'm kind of looking through my notes. I wanted to see if I missed anything I wanted to talk about. Now, last topic, and, and I'll let you guys go. And hopefully we'll have another night and some more videos very soon. But... Steve Gonzalez really feels as though the city of Moscow and the state of Idaho, it's a capital business decision happening right now with this case. Um, on top of the justice that's trying to be handled within this case, there's a lot of politics behind this. He feels as though there's a big part of those politics are going into this case, whether it be tearing down the home, uh, the financial realms are behind the university and other entities within this case and why it's going the way it is guys unfortunately in cases like this that happens a lot more so on the smaller scale cities of population than the bigger cities like a chicago and new york um you know dallas this is a smaller community where many people know each other far better than the bigger communities. They're more tight-knit. Um, so when something like this transpires within their community, they come together, they mold together, and they handle it together, they grieve together, they love each other, and they try to overcome it. Now, politics come into play with that. So I'm going to interject a little bit of a devil within the waters of this where he's speaking upon an outsider coming into that computed community and I believe as though that outsider is going to be at a severe disadvantage going into this situation and you know a lot of this case would be changing the Idaho structure of the courts and how they're handled and I'm not sure I'm not sure that's going to work out too well. So, just my opinion, he's at a severe disadvantage being that he's from a cross country and committed a crime in a death penalty state that is a smaller community. I know Idaho. I've been around Idaho. I've endured uh, situations in Idaho with law enforcement, and it is handled far differently than other places that I, I've been in trouble and I yes I, I have done a lot of time in death penalty states so I, I do understand the death penalty as well um, very good growing up friend of mine is on the death penalty as we speak in Arizona so I do understand it and I know what it's about I I I hope we can keep moving through this case and get more transparency than we've been able to get at this time. We need the cameras in the courtroom, everybody, even though at a moment I had thought about that and I thought I was against it. I believe that we truly need it. I, I think we need, need mainstream media to shake it up a little bit and quit putting out rumor. Maybe even follow, um, you know, more of what normal everyday people speak upon because there's a lot of uh, logic behind what some very intelligent people speak upon regarding this case and yes there's 
there's many questions, everybody. Every case doesn't have that. This case has a lot of questions. Whether you find him guilty already or don't, or you're walking down that line waiting for trial, that is based off of how you're seeing the evidence that's being presented so far. So I ask all of you, keep your minds open, keep watching, and everybody have uh, an open mind to the interview that um, Steve Gonzalez did. I will post the link within the comments if you have not seen it. Uh, that way you can watch it. Keep an open mind. Uh, really listen to him as a grieving father and someone that he's trying to do the right thing for his daughter. So I send him a lot of respect, his family a lot of respect and love. I send Idaho uh, all of all of the love that can possibly be sent your way as well. You guys have a lot of supporters out here across the country. We're all watching afar. We're all hoping for justice for the victims. Um, and, and we're going to be with you through this trial. And, and we stand with all of you, whether we agree out here or not on the, the defendant's guilt. We definitely all agree that every one of you deserves.